There's still an uncharted wilderness in America where unknown creatures could live. Hundreds of thousands of square miles unexplored by man, mapped only by aerial survey. A wilderness extensive enough to conceal a large population of hairy giants. This wilderness is shrinking. Civilization is narrowing its boundaries. And as it does, our contact with the Bigfoot creatures becomes more frequent. Each year, there are more footprints discovered, more sightings reported. On the edge of the Oregon wilderness, in the Dalles, Bigfoot investigators have now opened an information center, not unlike what was done at Loch Ness, to keep abreast of the increasing reports of such sightings. Um, what happened? Do you think, think you actually uh, saw something or heard something? Okay, did it look like a man? Was it, uh, was it walking upright? Okay, how big do you think it was? Bigfoot, like the Loch Ness monster before it, is a creature that most people reject until they see it themselves. One skeptic was Mrs. Mary Jefferson, a widow living alone in a small town in northern Washington. In late August 1973, she was distracted by the incessant barking of her dog. Emerging out of the wilderness, perhaps because of the recent forest fires in the north, came a creature Mrs. Jefferson had never seen before. team discovered giant footprints where Mrs. Jefferson said she saw the monster, providing supporting evidence to her testimony that Bigfoot had walked in her backyard. He was eight or ten feet tall, and he weighed seven or eight hundred pounds. Now, he, he walked upright like a man, and his hair, well, it was brownish, and it stood up on end. It was all tousled, and his face was just hideous, and he smelled... The search for Bigfoot in the United States is in its infancy. The search for a relative of the Bigfoot has already been underway in Asia for over half a century. In the Caucasus and Pamir mountain ranges of Russia, scientists have found proof of a Bigfoot creature, which they call the Almista. In the nearby Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world, Western explorers and investigators have pursued the riddle of another elusive man-ape, the hairy giant known as the Abominable Snowman, or the Yeti. Part of the mountain people's lives for centuries, the snowman only became known to the West in the late 19th century, when British mountaineers began to attempt to conquer Mount Everest. But it wasn't until 1951 when veteran climber Eric Shipton discovered a new pass at 19,000 feet that actual evidence was collected. Shipton, standing where no man had ever been before, took these photographs of giant man-like tracks. Once a non-believer in the Yeti, Shipton remembers. Well, I must say I felt I had a very strange feeling inside. I've often seen these tracks before, but I, hitherto I'd always been a bit of an agnostic about the whole question, but seeing these tracks so absolutely fresh and clear, um, well, there seemed to be no doubt about it at all, and it was that that really gave me a very uh, eerie feeling that here one was in the presence of something quite unknown. Although these strange footprints puzzled the scientific community, they reinforced the startling story told by a veteran explorer. Nicholas Tombazi of Athens, Greece, a photographer and a trained observer, had claimed he saw the abominable snowman on an expedition to Everest in 1925. Almost never seen by Westerners, the snowman was glimpsed by Tombazi in a clearing only 300 yards away. 
Tombazi described it as a dark and hairy, man-like creature that was grubbing for roots with a stick. Other evidence to prove the snowman's existence has been collected. In 1958, one expedition discovered this cave, thought to be the lair of the Yeti. In 1961, another expedition came across what was believed to be the hide of a yeti. Another discovered what was believed to be a yeti's mummified hand, and what was said to be the hide of a yeti's skull. Some anthropologists believe that the abominable snowman is a very primitive species of man. Others think it's a giant anthropoid, an undiscovered ape that has evolved in a direction other than man. They believe that these giant creatures migrated from Asia to America thousands of years ago on what was once the Bering Straits land bridge which linked Russia to Alaska. In support of this theory, there is the evidence of Bigfoot's continuous presence in Indian history, appearing in various forms on totem poles and paintings, and being called by different names, like Gilwick, Salatik, Oma, Bukwas, and Sasquatch. Part of the North American Indian's mythology from the beginning, Bigfoot was first encountered by a European in 1811. British explorer and mountain man David Thompson noted in his journal that while crossing the Rockies, he came across footprints made by a giant. Footprints whose great size, he wrote, could not have been made by bears. And in July of 1884, a British Columbia newspaper carried the account of the capture of a creature. A creature they called Jacko, whose description fits that of a young Bigfoot. Another early account of Bigfoot in America comes from President Theodore Roosevelt in a book he wrote about his days out west. The true story concerns two trappers on the Salmon River. It was in 1852. The trappers encountered the creature. Violence followed. One of the men was killed. Roosevelt wrote that he believed the story. In 1924, in British Columbia, a vacationing prospector, Albert Ostman, reported that he was captured and held prisoner by a family of four Bigfoot creatures. Ostman's incredible tale included observations that one scientist felt could only have come from a direct encounter with a large primate species. Ostman signed an affidavit before his death, attesting to the truthfulness of his story. That same year in Washington state, Fred Beck and four other miners reported they shot at two different Bigfoot creatures. Later, Beck and his friends were attacked by an angry group of Bigfoot giants who tried to destroy their cabin by rolling large boulders onto the roof. These and other accounts make up the long history of man's experience with Bigfoot in the forests of America. Stories from the past, colorful and exciting, and yet by themselves, not quite enough to prove that Bigfoot exists. We need something more. The accounts of eyewitnesses today, people whose stories we can check on firsthand. Such is the story of Mary Lou Bowman of a small town in western Michigan. The time, October 6th, 1974. The 17-year-old high school senior was waiting for her father. Don Bowman, a former high school football coach and now a respectable businessman, had never heard of the creature that he and his daughter were about to encounter, had no idea that the dark road ahead beyond where his daughter stood waiting for him held a promise of terror that would soon bolt up out of the shadows. How was your babysitting? Fine, except I didn't know they'd be on so late. <laughs> I had to stay. 
spend the whole weekend now doing homework. Today, police found giant footprints in the dirt on the side of the road near the site of the accident. Stories from eyewitnesses like Don Bowman and his daughter are the most compelling evidence for Bigfoot's existence. They are, in fact, Exhibit A in our investigation, and there are hundreds of them. Like this one from former Sheriff Oliver Potter. Like I say, I'm a barn in the woods, the Cascade Mountains. I know the animals that are here. This was something different that I had never seen before. Large creature, about seven and a half to eight foot tall. It was grayish black in color. And as it went away from me, I seen the back side of it walking as a man would walk on its hind legs. There were four of us in the car when we, uh, when I was the first one to sight it. We pulled up on the freeway and uh, pulled back for optimum viewing. Oh, I'd seen people from the same location and in about the same spot before. Humans up there, it, it probably was twice the size. And it was a dark, dark brown, just swaying back and forth, sitting on a rock. It moved more or less like a man, and it was about six, seven feet tall and probably a blackish brown color. And I couldn't see his face because it was running away from me across the road. And I, I actually, her and I both saw it disappear into the brush. I, like I say, I was born and raised around here, and bears just don't walk on his hind legs that long. Another eyewitness of the creature was Shirley Adams, a teacher and school bus driver in a small town on the coast of northern Washington. A longtime resident of the area, the young school teacher had often heard stories about the giant, hairy, ape-like monster, but she had never seen it. Never thought she would. What Shirley Adams saw did not frighten her. She experienced, in her own words, an unusual pleasure at seeing a creature at peace with nature. She observed the hairy giant for several moments and considered it not in terms of fear, but in terms of wonder. Eyewitness testimony, however, has had little such effect on the scientific community. Eyewitness reports are not reliable. People can think they see things. Their minds can play tricks on them. But Dr. Tibbet, so many people have seen Bigfoot. Now, is it possible that they're all hallucinating? Look, see this skull? Now, that's hard evidence, something to test, to deal with. Bring me a bone or a skull or, or a carcass, and then maybe I'll believe in Bigfoot. Look, hundreds of uh, law-abiding, respectable people have testified that they've seen Bigfoot. They've signed affidavits to that effect. They've even subjected themselves to examination under hypnosis. And yet the scientific community completely disregards such testimony. It's unreliable. Now, isn't it possible that science doesn't know how to use oral evidence? I mean, how to evaluate it, let's say the way the law does. Now, isn't oral testimony the basis of our judicial system? Well, I don't know. Science needs something concrete. Why, for instance, hasn't a hunter ever been able to find the remains of a dead Bigfoot in the forest? I mean, there have been so many people through the area where this thing supposedly has been seen, yet nothing. A valid question. To find out the answer, I talked to anthropologist Dr. Lawrence Bradley. Well, in reality, very few bones are ever found anywhere in the forest. When an animal dies, it's immediately eaten by another animal. This is the disposal service of nature at work. I go up in the woods in Oregon and Washington all the time, and I'd never seen the remains of bears or even mountain lions. And these animals are in abundance up there. Well, Dr. Bradley, it's been suggested by some people that maybe the Bigfoot creatures bury their dead. That's remotely possible. If Bigfoot is, as some of us think, a humanoid, a species of animal more man-like than beast. But it is possible. Yes. But it's a proposition completely rejected by my colleagues. 
But then my colleagues completely reject the possibility of Bigfoot. Bigfoot, most scientists say, cannot exist. But Dan Malachny of Deer Lodge, Montana, disagrees. I don't care what other people think. I saw Bigfoot 10 years ago. I was with 11 other Boy Scouts at the time. And uh, we were camping 18 miles south of Butte in the Deer Lodge National Forest. We had walked in to the forest oh, about five miles that day. It's not over yet, we got another mile. Mm -hmm. John, did you get a new, a new away flap? Not yet, I, I saw I did another hour of service. Oh, oh God, my boots are killing me. You're not the only one, man. They went, they went down in there and they found the cars smashed. After setting up camp, Dan and his friends ate dinner and then sat around and talked, telling jokes until bedtime. The boys were all in their bedrolls and fast asleep by 11 o'clock. Whatever it was in the forest, Dan's friend was the first to sense it, the first to hear it. morning we went up on the ridge where we saw the Bigfoot at and when we got up there we discovered a number of uh, footprints the biggest pr footprints I've ever seen and they look something like this exhibit B the footprints some 20 inches long eight inches wide footprints found impressed two inches deep into the earth an inch and a half deeper than a normal man's that show that a giant walks here, moving on two feet as a man moves. Footprints that should be permitted to establish the existence of a creature, if, after all, fingerprints can be used to hang one. These footprints, however, in spite of their number, do not convince the scientific community that Bigfoot exists. These scientists maintain that nature plays tricks with footprints, especially in the snow. Footprints, they say, change shape and grow larger as they continuously melt and refreeze. I asked Peter Byrne, formerly a big game hunter in the Himalayas, about this theory of distorted footprints in the snow. Uh, small footprints do melt out, this is true. Footprint of a deer, say two inches across, may become five or six or even seven inches across when it melts but they do not melt with any uniformity. So that um, if you had a line of these footprints, the melted footprints of a small animal, they come out completely out of um, any uniformity, different shapes, squares, circles, oblongs, and so on. And I think it's um, um, ridiculous to suggest that uh, a small animal and the melting snow could really make a Bigfoot track. 
believe that the giant footprints are made by bears, who, as they move, place their hind feet into the tracks of their front feet. I don't think this is possible. The footprints that I've seen are very definite. They're very definitely the foot of a large um, bipedal um, a hominid, a human-like creature with five toes. Um, when you get an overlap, you get a confusion of toes and heels and so on. These are clear-cut footprints, and in my mind, there's no mistake. They could not be a quadruped. If the footprints are not distorted by nature or made by a quadruped like bears, scientists say they're footprints made by hoaxers, like Ray Pickens of Chehalis, Washington. Seven times, beginning in 1971, Pickens has tracked the wilderness with bogus Bigfoot tracks. His purpose? Not to fool the scientists, but to fool the monster hunters. He tells us why. Well, we were sitting there having coffee at this uh, Arden Cafe, and uh, two gentlemen came in, and they was asking us about Bigfoot. And we said, well, uh, we didn't believe in it. And one gentleman says, uh, well, you hicks around Arden probably wouldn't. And I turned to my friend, which his name is Harvey, and I says, Harvey, we're hicks. What are we going to do about it? And he says, yeah, what are we going to do about it? And I says, we're going to show them who the hicks are. And then I went home and made boots. Hoaxers have fooled the experts occasionally, but anthropologist Grover Krantz of Washington State University insists that fakers could not have made all the giant footprints. There are a number of um, footprints that I've seen that um, are faked, and this can be done. But on the other hand, there are a few that show some characteristics that I think could not have been faked. This is one such footprint. This uh, cast, I've uh, drawn in the approximate reconstructions of the bones. This uh, is a crippled individual where a couple of bulges have extended out between adjacent bones on the outer edge of the foot. If this had been a human foot, these bulges would have been farther back. But they're shifted forward, making the heel longer and the front of the foot shorter. This is exactly what is required for a foot that's going to carry a, perhaps an 800-pound body. Now, I don't think any faker could have thought of it and figured this out and adjusted his footprint accordingly. A fake footprint is just simply an ex expanded, enlarged uh, footprint or an enlarged copy of a human foot. With this convincing background, I now thought it best to talk to a trained observer who personally discovered such giant tracks, like newspaper man Ed McLarney of Stevenson, Washington. I turned my head and looked in the direction Marv was pointing. Down, down below us, for as far as the eye could see, were two sets of tracks coming parallel up this terrifically st steep ridge. They crossed the road. We walked up the road just a little bit farther, and they crossed the road right in front of us. Big, big tracks. They were firm tracks, and obviously the kinds of tracks that people have talked about when they described Bigfoot. And what was especially convincing was the terrific distance between footprints. I have got pretty long legs. I'm nearly 6'4", and uh, I could not, in trying to stretch my feet, uh, could not duplicate what we were seeing there. I had to jump from one track to another to, to duplicate the distance between tracks. In the first place, I do not think that any human being would have been physically capable of marching up that ridge in that deep snow in the second place that superhuman strength was required to do it. For years, the only proof of Bigfoot's existence were the accounts of eyewitnesses and the plaster casts of footprints. It's only now, during the last decade, that proof in the way of physical evidence has begun to be accumulated. Here, in these woods, in a remote region of the High Sierra, some of that evidence has been collected. It was in the fall of 1972, and three men, Alan Berry, Rick Murphy, and Tim Sawyer, had just discovered human-like footprints 20 inches long. They'd heard about the creature called Bigfoot, but they never thought they'd encounter it. The men were relaxing after a hard day in the woods. I'll tell you, the next time we're coming out, he's doing the cooking, not you. 
<laughs> All right, I don't, I don't need any ribbing about that. Yeah. Though, you know. I told you guys I came up here as the guy. The guy. <laughs> <laughs> you believe that? Yeah. And uh, next time, uh, Mel can do the cooking. Oh, huh? that's that's a good idea. Well, I'll go uh, home with Barry Barry. Yeah. <laughs> it's room. Like, like, uh, hey, the guy. Hey, hello. Excuse me. Listen. <laughs> Sounds like my mother-in-law. Hey, don't joke around. Listen. <laughs> I never heard anything like that before. Me neither. I'm gonna get that on the tape report. Fortunately, on this trip to the Sierras, Alan Berry had his tape recorder along to record the sounds of various birds and animals. Calmly, he reached for this and not for his rifle. Where's it coming? I don't know. tapes recorded by Alan Berry to Dr. Robert Sheldon. Not knowing what strange creature made these sounds, Dr. Sheldon subjected them to a rigorous computer analysis. How do you go about analyzing these tapes? The first thing we do is to digitize this, uh, the sound into the computer. Digitizing consists of converting each second of sound into 20,000 numbers uh, that are stored in the files on the computer. We can select uh, any portion of this we'd like and uh, do a frequency analysis on this portion. We've chosen the ah sound from the tape because it seems to have an unusual formant structure. You mean that you've picked uh, just a certain part of this tape, one section of it? We've taken a section of this tape for analysis, much like a scientist might take a piece that he wants to analyze and look at it under a microscope. This particular sound that we're looking at has a frequency structure that's lower than the normal male human voice. For example, we could do a sample of your voice, and then we could compare the uh, analysis of your vowel with the analysis that we have from the tape. You can speak into the microphone here, and we can record that into the computer. Uh, just uh, say, ah. Ah. Uh. Comparison of the two printouts showed that the creature's vowel sound peaked early, higher than mine. My sound edged out at a secondary lower peak. I asked Dr. Sheldon what he could learn from these comparisons. Human male has a vocal tract uh, on the average of about 17 centimeters long. This analysis tells us that based on the form and frequencies of this sound, we would have a vocal tract of about 25 centimeters long. You see, so that could give you some idea of the size of whatever creature made the, the noise. Uh, yes. We could say that, that the vocal tract that produced these sounds would have been at least 50% uh, larger than a human male. Then that means that if I'm over six feet tall, the creature that made this sound must be over nine feet tall. Uh, that's probably true, yes. Are there any other tests that you can do to, to uh, analyze the tape? We can do what we call a formant track. That's, uh, it's similar to a voice print. It's a newer and better way to do a voice print analysis on the computer. We can look at the movement of the frequencies and say something about the articulatory flexibility. During the 15 minutes of sound on this tape, uh, we have examples of three vowels, a, eh, a, eh, and o. Oh but nowhere on the tape 
is there the sound E. Now the sound E requires moving the tongue forward in the mouth. And uh, if we look at the uh, physical structure of, say, a gorilla, the gorilla has the neck at a different angle, and it's impossible for the gorilla to move his tongue forward in order to make the E sound. Uh, the fact that we don't see this sound on the tape uh, suggests that this creature perhaps had, uh, did not have the ability to make that sound. Do you know what made these sounds? No, I don't. Well, the first Exhibit C. Is this into the sounds made by an unknown creature, probably Bigfoot. That consists of... Sounds that seem to indicate that the creature is more man than ape. Similar sounds to those heard by Alan Berry and his friends have been heard by others, by those on expeditions searching for Bigfoot, and by men like Hal Williamson of Idaho. Williamson, a longtime fisherman and outdoorsman, was vacationing in British Columbia, Canada, when he first heard the strange sounds, coming, it seemed, from a great distance. The sounds seemed to be coming closer, and suddenly they were upon him. Confident sportsman, Williamson was determined to find out more about the creature he heard and saw. The air was heavy with a foul odor, a stench Williamson later described as being, in his own words, one of the worst smells he's ever experienced. Curiosity outweighing its fears, Williamson, unarmed, made his way to the area where he had spotted the Bigfoot. Silence now replaced the eerie screams of the giant creature. But the stench in the air told Williamson that the monster was still nearby. Later, hair found nearby was classified as belonging to no known animal. Did they talk up? Yeah. Spurred on by the increasing numbers of sightings, by the accumulating data pointing to the creature's possible existence, more and more organized expeditions are taking to the field to find a Bigfoot. This one is under the direction of Robert Morgan of Miami, Florida. The expedition hopes to photograph a live Bigfoot or produce evidence of a dead one. They believe a colony of over 200 Bigfoot creatures inhabits the unexplored wilderness of the Pacific Northwest. The expedition has tried to anticipate the creature's movements, running the roads, keeping a watchful eye for any evidence of its passing. Thinking Bigfoot to be a nocturnal creature, they're prepared to penetrate the darkness of night with special light amplification viewing devices. Morgan, a former government computer specialist, began to pursue Bigfoot only after having seen one, he says, in 1957. And all of a sudden, this thing went through the bushes. He didn't go around. He went, I mean, I could see the wake, you know. Mm -hmm. Just plowed right through it, and he moved up at an angle away from me. I was on the edge of a canyon. And at a point, I, I estimate about 40 yards from me, it went into a, an opening, a clearing in the, in the brambles. And uh, what I saw was the most manlike looking Gorilla, in my estimation, that I've ever seen. Okay. And uh, that's traveling slow. And Expeditions like this one have gone out armed with tranquilizing guns and cameras. 
The object is to bring back evidence to force the scientific establishment to take a more active part in the search for Bigfoot. There's the fork in the road. Hmm. One part of that way, and we go up this way here. Okay. Pete, Ann, Ted, we'll see you in three days. Though it did not find a Bigfoot, this team did find hair and fecal droppings. Evidence found on expeditions like that of Robert Morgan's, and evidence found by chance, by hunters and hikers, eventually finds its way into scientific laboratories like this one. Some of it has yielded interesting results. For instance, though some feces collected and turned in are found to be that of bears or other animals, others remain unexplained, unidentifiable, possibly from a creature unknown to science. Now, a great deal can be learned from droppings. For example, the eating habits of the creature, which in turn can help those who are looking for Bigfoot. Now, the Morgan expedition reports that examination of feces leads them to believe that Bigfoot feeds on roots and grass and berries and tree shoots. And therefore, in their search for Bigfoot, they are following the growth of these succulents. Now, samples of hair believed to be that of Bigfoot are frequently brought in for examination. And again, though most of it turns out to be that of bears or some other known animal, there is that occasional finding, a strand of hair that defies analysis. Not that of a bear, not a man or a coyote or a wolf, but of something unknown. Thank you. Several times such hair samples have stymied scientific definition. Now, these hair samples were found at the site of giant human-like footprints and after a sighting of a Bigfoot creature. The hair samples then should be labeled Exhibit B, a piece of evidence which the United States Army has endorsed in its official engineering atlas covering the state of Washington. In a section about the wildlife of the state, Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, is featured. The text goes on to report that hair samples sent to the FBI labs have defied analysis. Exhibit E, the Minnesota Iceman. What might have been the only body of a Bigfoot ever found by modern man. At first, nothing more than a carnival exhibit, a rotting corpse partially visible in a block of ice. Later to be thought of by at least two international scientists as an unknown large primate perhaps the dead body of a young Bigfoot. This unusual evidence mysteriously disappeared in 1968. Next, I turn to an investigative avenue often taken by the world's police departments to get another, if unusually different, viewpoint of the creature's existence. A viewpoint the police departments in Miami, Boston, Los Angeles, and even Scotland Yard have called upon to help solve seemingly unsolvable crimes. I went to Peter Hurkos, the world's foremost psychic detective at his home in Los Angeles. I took with me, unknown to him, and concealed in a suitcase, a plaster cast of a giant Bigfoot footprint. Perkos, who has worked with police on such cases as the Boston Strangler and the Ann Arbor Murders, has the unusual psychic gift of being able to read facts from unseen objects, to sense the reality and truth of such objects, and to describe in detail from telepathic images in his brain what is hidden from his view. I didn't know what to do with it. But I had to do any type of science may impose. I have something inside this yeah. case that I want to know something more about. Yeah. Now, can you uh, psychometrize what's in here without ever having seen it and tell me something about it, anything? I, I, I will try. All right. Can I, I set it up or what? Yes, you can put it any way you like. It's in a half, half man, half uh, animal. Um, it's about 
I would say about 500 pounds. It's about between eight and nine feet. Lives in cave, lives in cave. Eat part of animals, uh, the intestine and animals. Eat and also berries and green stuff. It's uh, not a gorilla, it's like a uh, man, uh, strong chest and uh, long arms, uh, normal fingers like we have. Uh, very hairy, long hair and short beard type. Peter, do you want me to draw the picket the way I see the... Will you? Yes, sure. Yeah. I have this paper. Just a dazzling display of Peter Herko's psychic powers. Powers that not only determined what was in a closed case, but powers that said the object in that case was authentic, not a fake, that it was made by a living creature, by a Bigfoot. Exhibit F, Peter Herkos, the vision of a psychic detective. For Exhibit G, I travel to a small Washington town not far from the Canadian border, increasingly more intrigued by the abundance of psychic and physical evidence. The most compelling evidence for Bigfoot's existence, however, remains the eyewitness reports. And the most compelling of these are when the creature has been seen at the same time by more than one person. Now, in police work, this is called corroboration, and it's another way to establish the truth. Now, there are scores of such corroborative stories in the Bigfoot investigation, but the most interesting to me are these. This file contains the accounts of over a dozen sightings of Bigfoot, all taking place within a 30-day period in this small Washington town. It was during a salmon run on the river, and Mr. and Mrs. Tom Stern were the first to encounter the creature. It was during September, 1975, Great day for fishing. Yes, it really is. Say, by the way, what time's your brother coming over this evening? Oh, I don't know, fairly early. There's something wrong with this reel. Well, it's the one you wanted, sweetheart. I don't know, maybe it's me. I don't seem to be working it right. <laughs> well, you work it right and catch some fish, and I promise I'll fry them. <laughs> Would you mind taking a look at it? What is that? Stern's sighting of the hairy creature, backed up by their discovery of giant footprints, was to be followed by a more terrifying experience. Police cards on file at the county sheriff's office recount the horror of that second encounter. 10.10 p.m., September 12, 1975. Rita Graham was alone in the living room watching television. I think she sent some 
flowers. I... Get Ten more such sightings in the town within the next three weeks, the most dramatic of which took place in the early morning hours of September 16th, while three Indian youths were fishing on the Nooksack River. John Green, 31, a recreational director for the Lummi Indian Council, and two friends were taking turns drifting down the channel, trailing their nets, fishing for salmon. Fifty feet upstream, John Green heard a strange noise. He became aware of a strong, unpleasant smell, felt something tugging at his nets, but he saw nothing. so many people over a period of time could fabricate and maintain their stories, that is, tell lies, or are they telling the truth? With me is William Stenberg, a former police officer for the Glendale Police Department, a man licensed by the state of California to do polygraph work, that is, to conduct lie detector examinations. We're about to test the story of one of those townspeople, Johnny Green, whose story you've just seen. We're going to give him a lie detector test to see if he was telling the truth. In order that the test meet every standard of normal investigative work, our cameras will not intrude on the examination. We'll watch from back here through a two-way mirror. Johnny's reactions will not be altered by our presence. Well, Mr. Stenberg, can you tell me basically how the polygraph works? Yes, sir, I can. This is a Keeler polygraph three-channel instrument. It records the breathing in the pneumotube, which is placed around the subject's abdomen. The cardio cuff, which is placed upon either the left or right arm, records the rise and fall in the subject's blood pressure. A galvanic skin response is placed upon either the left or right hand, and it records certain perspiration emitted by the palm of the hand. All the reactions are recorded independently by the three pens, the pneumo, galvanic skin response, and the cardio. All questions require yes or no answers. No movement, John. Test spot to begin. Close your eyes, please, John. Is your true name John Green? Yes. Do you intend to answer all of my questions truthfully? Yes. Do you believe you saw a creature seven feet tall, standing in the water of the Nooksack River at 2.30 a.m. Yes. 
and you feel and see the creature pull on the tailboard of past your fishing net? Yes. Do you see the creature in your light? Yes. Were you truthful to me when you described the creature seven feet tall, heavy build, covered with hair and a head shaped like a gorilla? Yes. To complete a polygraph test, Stenberg asks the same 12 questions three times each. Have you lied to me on any of these questions? No. Test is complete, John. Please remain seated. The polygraph machine confirms that John Green did see something that night in the Nooksack River, something large and hairy, something John Green and his neighbors called Bigfoot. Your eyelids are becoming heavier. Another way to test the truthfulness of eyewitnesses is through hypnosis, where people can more vividly recall things they saw and did but cannot remember. It's going to become limp. For this reason, police departments around the world now utilize hypnosis to get at the truth. Eyelids are becoming more and more heavy. I'm in the office of Dr. Sidney Walter, a clinical psychologist licensed by the California State Board of Medical Examiners. A former professor at UCLA and a government consultant, Dr. Walter specializes in the use of hypnosis. And he is, at this moment, placing Jerry Lou Welchel of Fontana, California, into a hypnotic trance. Now, Jerry Lou has already told me that she, her girlfriend, and two children all saw Bigfoot one night six years ago. Dr. Walter will now test her story under hypnosis. You're back into the summer of 1968. It is summertime of 1968. It is summertime of 1968. You're going to call up your girlfriend, Kathy. You're going to get into your T-Bird and drive towards that location. And you're going to relive and experience everything in detail. Step by step. over to your house? Well, you just left here. Yeah. No, he said that they were going up to see about that monster. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you want to go? I'll get the kids ready. Okay, see you in a few minutes. Okay, get your coats on. Okay, come here, Sherry. Jerry Lou, now actually in a deep hypnotic trance, okay, go get in the car. is recalling how she and a girlfriend went out to a deserted drag strip to investigate the reports of a monster seen there the night before. Now get back in the seat and sit down. Is Kathy home? There you go. Okay. Now, where was it? The drag strip. Nah. No monster's gonna be there. No. Okay. Kathy, look out. Get down, get down, get down. Oh. Oh. She's breathing. I'm all right, I'm all right. 
Let's go to the police. Come on. Drift deeper and deeper into a relaxed state now, Jerry. Drift deeper and deeper into a relaxed state. You could hear me clearly. Let your whole body become calm and relaxed. Now you can recall scenes as I ask you questions. They'll be very vivid, very clear to you, but you are safe and sound. You are safe and sound at home. Jerry, you could hear me clearly. What were you frightened of? It, it was big. It smelled terrible. It was big and smelled terrible? Yes. It, it, it just... It smelled terrible. It smelled terrible. Can you describe what frightened you even more? Most of all, is it getting to the kids. It was, it was terrible. Terrible. It was. It was. It was like a. I can't explain it. It's just big, hairy, and it hurt me. How big do you believe it was? Using mm -hmm. hypnosis as a tool to help us mm -hmm. establish the truth. We have verified an actual eyewitness account of an encounter with Bigfoot. I touched you, Jerry. Exhibit H, the still photographs. This one taken in 1965 in Oregon by an experienced woodsman, Zach Hamilton. And this one taken in 1974 in British Columbia, Canada by an Ohio woman on vacation. Third one taken in Alaska in 1973. Pictures of the creature would seem to be all the proof that's needed to confirm Bigfoot's existence. And the most famous picture of Bigfoot is this one, taken by Yakima Washington rodeo rider Roger Patterson in 1967 in Bluff Creek, California. Patterson took about 28 feet of motion picture film, the most controversial film of its kind. It startled the scientific world. Anthropologist Grover Krantz of Washington State University, Dr. Donald W. Grieve, a London scientist, and Dr. Dmitry Donsky, the chief of biomechanics at a Russian institute, all studied the film, and they could find no reason to doubt the film's authenticity. And John Napier, a primate biologist, formerly of the Smithsonian Institution, also studied the film, and he wrote in his book that he, too, is convinced that Bigfoot exists. Patterson took his famous film while on an expedition with a colleague. They were tracking down the giant, hairy, man-like monster. Patterson had been searching for the creature for eight years. Suddenly, there was a commotion. Patterson's horse reared, throwing him. Patterson grabbed his camera and filmed as he ran. Here is his actual footage, the images he captured, what he called the abominable snowman of America, or Bigfoot. If this film is legitimate, then there can no longer be any question about Bigfoot's existence. To verify its legitimacy, I went to anthropologist Grover Krantz at Washington State University. There is one film that was made by Roger Patterson in 1967 of what appears to be a Sasquatch that I am reasonably convinced now is a legitimate piece of film. I've checked just about every possible measurement of that film, have, having looked at it oh, at least 50 times now. And I don't think there's any way Pat Patterson could have figured this all out and faked it. 
I also asked Dr. Jeffrey Bourne, director of the prestigious Yerkes Primate Lab in Atlanta, Georgia, to analyze the film. Well, you know, uh, that looks to me very much like a human walk. Its gait is very much uh, of a human-type gait. If you have a large primate who has basically the bipedal locomotion, he would have to have a human-like gait. This is exactly what I would expect. And also, when you look at its, um, at its feet as it walks, uh, the undersurface is uh, much too light colored for an animal with this kind of dark fur. The light color on the bottom of the feet is perfectly normal for um, any primates or, well, most hominid-like primates. Um, Africans with uh, black skin have very light colored uh, soles of the feet. This is simply because the stratum corneum is very thick and carries less of the pigment. And furthermore, it seems to have uh, the characteristics of both male and female. The head has a big crest on it, like a male gorilla does, and this uh, crest is called a sagittal crest. Now, this creature also has pendulous breasts, which is a female characteristic. The crest, the sagittal crest on the top of the head, has been um, claimed as a male characteristic uh, in the Patterson film. Well. Yes, it's a characteristic of adult male gorillas and orangutans, but it's not a male characteristic, it's a size characteristic. Beyond a certain size, the jaw muscles must find attachment on a special crest, and it happens that only male gorillas and orangutans get that big. If there were a female primate of the 5 to 500 pound body size, it would have to be so big that it would have a crest as well, so it's not a male characteristic. And the breasts are covered in fur, and in all other primates, the breasts are actually either bare or very sparsely haired. I don't know what the breast of a Sasquatch ought to look like. Uh, of course, what's going on there is, in Patterson's film, the creature has a, a bulge here, which seems to be a two-part bulge, but it's not really very clear. This might not actually be uh, uh, breasts. These could be outpouchings from the uh, trachea, which occur in um, many large apes, called laryngeal air sacs. Patterson, who died of cancer in 1972, swore on his deathbed that this film was authentic. His partner that day also swears that what you are seeing now is a picture of a real Bigfoot. Satisfied with this evidence, some scientists are now trying to classify the Bigfoot creatures, declaring them to be perhaps a more evolved species of a fossilized ape, a more man-like Gigantopithecus. They've begun to study the living habits of the creatures, based on the voluminous accounts of eyewitnesses for the past hundred years. They've determined that there is a large colony of the creatures, perhaps 200 of them, centered mainly in the Pacific Northwest. They're nomadic creatures who travel in small groups and oftentimes alone, following the food supply. They're mainly vegetarians, eating roots, berries, fruits, and nuts. Some have been seen, though not frequently, eating small rodents like field mice. of them digging for clams at an ocean beach. Bigfoot creatures have also been seen pulling fish from the streams and taking them from fishermen's barrels outside their homes. They have never been known to use fire or to use tools, though they have frequently been seen using a stick or a stone to dig for food. They build no permanent dwellings, making their beds under trees or in caves. They sleep mostly during the day, traveling and looking for food at night, finding safety in the darkness. They have keen, animal-like senses, and they're quick to perceive danger. 
They're strong and very fast for creatures their size. And yet, they're non-territorial, yielding the land to the first intruder. Some accounts indicate that the Bigfoot creatures might live in family units. Albert Ostman's observations in 1924 show that the father performed certain patriarchal duties for his family. The young of the Bigfoot probably enjoy a longer childhood than do most creatures in the wild. They're dependent on their elders for food, for protection, and for instruction in how to deal with the wild animals in the forest and with man. They themselves are not predators. If they were, more would be known about them. For a giant creature that attacked and fed on cougars and goats and deer could not long escape the watchful eye and the ready rifle of the hunter. They're shy and wary creatures, apparently gentle toward both man and beast, creatures alive to the possibilities of the wilderness. They're elusive creatures, hard to catch a glimpse of. Creatures, perhaps like man, still evolving into a higher order. There are some who believe that the Bigfoot creatures are man, primitive man, and as such are entitled to all the protection our society offers other men. One true story that illustrates Bigfoot's human likeness is that told about an Oregon high school teacher, William Lawrence. Lawrence was driving with his wife, Kathy, on a backcountry road in the spring of 1973. A lot of good fishing around here, especially this time of year. See everything you want, you get. Son of a... You see that? I'll get my rifle and get a shot at this thing. shoot, like so many others before him who have had Bigfoot in their rifle sights. I can't. It, it looks human. Unable to shoot, Lawrence later described Bigfoot as having the eyes of a thinking creature, not the eyes of a wild animal. Man or beast? What it is is still unknown. Some believe that Bigfoot is a kind of ape undiscovered by science, or a prehistoric species of ape thought to be extinct. Others speculate it might be the so-called missing link or even early man. Whatever it is, the volume of evidence seems conclusive. Our Earth is host to such giant creatures as the Bigfoot. There are the sightings, corroborated by hypnosis and polygraph tests, the footprints, the sound recordings, the photographs, the film, all enough to prove that Bigfoot is as much a part of our life as the gorilla or the Loch Ness Monster. Bigfoot is today free to roam the forests of America, living off the land but leaving no trace of his passage except for an occasional footprint. He's gigantic and powerful, and yet he harms nobody and destroys nothing. He is at peace with the wilderness. But this wilderness is vanishing. Each year, the press of civilization converts our forests into towns, our meadows into roads. The land the Bigfoot lives on shrinks. Soon, they may be driven from their wilderness cover, like Ishii, the dawn man of Redding, California. And we will at last know what they are and then there will be no more skeptics. Man will continue to try to solve the mystery of Bigfoot, but as we do, let us hope that we will not destroy what we seek to understand.